and you are here. You are the same. We thank you. We worship you. We come here to give you praise and thanksgiving. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. Continue your Holy Spirit's work in each of our lives through your word. Thank you that we can be part of your family through your grace and mercy in the shed blood of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. May you be praised, adored, and worshiped today. Thank you for your presence. Pour out your grace upon this world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for our call to worship. Praise the Lord. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Shall we turn to him number 593? to sing. You might want to read that hymn and read it over a few times. Shall we turn to hymn number 53? 53. Yeah. 
this time, Aiden will read for us Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of, the de sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is seventy years, or eighty, if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work for our hands. At this time, turn to hymn 129, Lo, Jesus Comes.
Yes, thank the Lord. He is coming. We don't know when, but we need to be ready for the Lord's coming. For some announcements, please keep in mind our missions conference. You can sign up in the foyer. And also, uh, pledge cards. We want to pray about our giving support. God's servants around the world in various countries international workers, and so on. So we'll be praying about that and our giving uh, the month of October. And I think some of us received uh, the information on the missions conference signing up on different nights. I think it's the 20th and 21st and then the 25th, the weekend. You'll be happy to know Ben Anderson will be coming with his wife. Chelsea and three children on October 21, 22nd. We have nine lines, summed up, nine lines signed up so far for the money gift for our missionaries. If you haven't signed up yet, please see the sign-up sheets on the table in the foyer. Also, please feel free to sign up for the catered meals. We're still in need of two volunteers on Wednesday, October 21, to set up and serve the catered meal. We're also in need of five pies for Sunday night, October 25th, and two breakfast casseroles for Sunday morning, and three gallons of milk. We got this down to pies and milk. If you'd like to help out anyway, please see the sign-up sheets in the foyer. Thank you. Again, feel free to pick up your Faith Promise Pledge card in the offering plate anytime or put it in the offering plate anytime in October and November. Before we go into any other announcements, let's keep praying for Cheryl White, uh, for Priscilla Bumgardner, for Ellie Fisher as she is recovering from surgery, Ken Weimer recovering from his sixth bypass surgery, uh, for Kathy Verbonitz, Bob's wife. Keep praying for Yvonne's family and losing of her. Uh, it's a grandfather, I believe. Trying to remember. I have uh, Ford is not well. My, uh, my pastor friend, Thomas Henry, indeed, their grandson Ford is 10 years old. He has that muscular nerve atrophy and he's not well at all. I don't believe they're going to another hospital. They're just going to let the Lord take him when he does. And he's not very good condition. Ten years old, believe it or not, September 18th. Never walked, never even sat up. And for the adjustment of a mom and a mother, particularly and dad, who went through that ten years and with that uh, kind of uh, affliction seeing their son with. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Steve. Yep, pray for Mary Ann Tipperary and her husband. She has coronavirus. It still is a disease going around. Anyone else? Unspoken requests? Unspoken requests. Yes, Diane? Kathy Hearn, Carolyn Clapper, Clem Snyder, and uh, yes, Greg. What's his name? Ivan Albright? That falling down is not a good option the older you get. 81, wow. Anyone else? Unspoken request, Trevor. 
Anyone else? Yes, Laura. Bill Purdy getting a pacemaker put in. Anyone else? Shall we bow for prayer? Thank you, Lord, for a great day. Thank you for these requests. And the reality is, Father, we praise you for who you are. May we, by your spirit, learn about you, you your character, who you are. Lord, that alone, as we look to you and keep our eyes fixed upon you, you lift us up from discouragement, despair, and heartache. You have a way of encouraging us, keep, keeping us going, strengthening us. And that your light shines through our lives in the midst of the darkness. We thank you for successful surgeries. We're sad to hear people have lost uh, grandparents and who are about to lose loved ones. We pray that by your Holy Spirit in each of these situations as people go on with life without loved ones in all kinds of families, those about to lose loved ones, those have recovered from surgery, those about to face surgery. Father, we pray that by your spirit you will oversee each of these lives, that they will be conscious of your presence and your love and your grace and your mercy. For you are bigger than all these things we ever face. You are Lord, Lord over all and Lord over our lives. And you have the power to deliver us. You have the power to heal us in any way you so choose. But may we keep our eyes upon you. Encourage your people, Lord. We pray for our world and for continued wisdom and strength uh, for people trying to defeat this virus. And also other viruses, Lord, and the sicknesses that afflict our bodies. We thank you for the progress so far. And we pray also for proper implementation of, for people to, to get back to work and open things up even more. Uh, that your hand will be seen in all this. Lord, give us the strength. Uh, many times in the world, Lord, people try to do things without you. And we pray that by your spirit, you will use your people to shed light on reality and uh, use your people uh, to point people to you and also to help people in their physical bodies and their mental and emotional in every way that your people will be as lights to follow in the darkness we experience throughout our world. And we commit to our nation and all that's going on and the conflict and the heartache we pray again that your hand will be seen and your hand will be seen through the lives of your people. You will have your way in us and through us for your glory and honor and praise. Give grace and wisdom uh, to our people. Pour out your grace upon this nation. We look to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Give you the glory and the praise. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Aiden to come with other announcements, and we do have a video on Operation Christmas Child. Believe it or not, it's October, going to November. I won't, you know, it's supposed to rain today, but one day it's going to, that white stuff is going to come down, believe it or not. And so we'll trust the Lord, we'll be ready for that too. Blair County Life Chain, Sunday, October 4th from 2 to 3 p.m. at 17th Street and 9th Avenue, Altoona at Station Mall Medical Center. Wednesday at 7 p.m., there's men's, boys' Bible study and prayer in the conference room. Ladies and girls' Bible study and prayer in the junior classroom in the Community Life Center. And uh, Ben Ch and Chelsea Anderson and the three children from West Africa will be here Wednesday, October 21st. And the meal will be chicken alfredo spaghetti and meatballs with salad and brownies and on thursday october 22nd it will be subway subs cookies and chips the sign-ups in the foyer or call the number there catered suppers at six and the service is at seven any other announcements okay, i guess what 
will watch this video at this time. Operation Christmas. The kids are playing, are laughing, joyful. It's like a whole world to them. Because for the first time, they have received this precious gift. Operation Christmas Child gives our church an opportunity to touch the world. It's a great adventure to evangelize. You've got an army of volunteers that pack the boxes that are helping OCC to take the gospel literally to millions of children. This is the Good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. Getting people locally to think globally. What I love about OCC is that they are intentional about pouring into the lives of kids. They receive a box and also an invitation to come back and learn more about Christ. We just don't want to just hand out a box and stop there. We want them to grow in their faith. It's a great tool, an effective tool to reach communities with the gospel of Jesus. It's exciting to get people to heaven, but it's also exciting to get heaven to people. We need the overhead, too. Thank you. I'll try to put in the bulletin next two weeks, the nominating committee. We established that for our annual meeting in November. At this time, Aiden will we'll read to us Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you are serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which it, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, may be given me, so that I will fiercely make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an amb ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. 
Tysicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. At this time, we'll have the chorus medley. Hold on. Because I'm not the chorus medley, believe me. Thank goodness. I don't know if anybody knows, but October's uh, Pastor Appreciation Month. And um, I just want to... I don't have a Bible in my hand, but uh, maybe this is one. But I can only, we can only be glad that we have a pastor that preaches from this. Because in many churches in the world, and even in our United States, of the major denominations don't preach from this anymore. And they have pastors who actually don't even believe to be saved. And that's hard to believe, but I've heard it on numerous radio programs, people talking about it. And uh, we can only be glad and uh, be appreciated that we do have a pastor that does believe in this and preaches from it. And he's reaching a lot of people and his family and other families. And, uh, you know, we just want to say thank you for that. And because um, it, it is a big deal because everything we really need in life is probably right. Um, it is in here. It's not just probably it is if you just start reading. But you got to read it. You just can't sit it there and have it think you're going to absorb it in your brain. You got to read it. Thank you. <laughs> now, also, I think today is Becky's birthday. You got to watch how you handle women, though, because they don't have a they don't have as big a sense of humor as I have. So. So I got to watch how I say stuff. I've learned that from 49 years of experience. 51, actually. I've known that woman for a long time. She probably thinks way too long. <laughs> Whatever. But uh, one day this uh, grandchild went up to his grandmother and said, uh, Grammy, how old are you? Grammy thought for a little bit and she said, hmm, I'm 29 and holding. And the boy just thought a little bit again. He says, well, how old would you be if you weren't holding? So I won't ask you how long you've been holding, but that's all right. So happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yep. Thank you. We'll have the chorus. Uh, they can sing happy birthday then. Good morning, guys. It's your time. Thank you. I'm not 29 and holding, I'm 21 and holding. But bless your hearts, we love you all. Thank you for your love and your kindness. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank the Lord we were able to see our daughter and grandchildren. She loved that. I got home last night and our son sent flowers from Australia. Well, he phoned them over and paid for them and they delivered them. So, thank the Lord for that. Thank you. Thank you for your love. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works.
Children are dismissed for Children's Church. Shall we turn to Psalm 90? Psalm 90. I give God the glory in the name of Jesus for his love for me expressed all these years and through various congregations including yourself. I thank the Lord for you and pray for you and pray that God will help me to be the pastor he wants me to be uh, in relationship to you, especially in these days. This psalm kind of encapsulizes the experience of God's people in each generation. <clears throat> The first verse and second verse is about God, his person. He exists before the mountains were brought forth in the world. He's from everlasting to everlasting. We're from verse 3 on to verse 11. We live in the world. And then there's a response to us of this reality if we allow God to speak to our hearts. And the response is from 12 on to the end of the chapter. So God is a person who exists and is without number. God's days are without number. Our days are numbered. And we've often heard the expression, your number's up. <laughs> And our number will be up one day, whether we want it to be or not. That's the reality. But what do, we want, what do we want to leave behind to our children? 
And there's a prayer that I am going to give or read that trust that this will be the prayer of your life as a result of this psalm. As we read through this psalm, as Aiden read through this psalm, and I'll read the first verse and second verse again. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, O oh, you brought forth the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turned men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins of the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80. If we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. But they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright. That we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And here is the prayer. Everlasting God, establish, establish the work, your work of favor upon our lives that our children, our children will see. And follow you. Everlasting God. Establish the work of your favor. Upon our lives. That our children will see. And follow you. We live in time of. Great conflict. Yet it's. Just another form of conflict. We do not know the afflictions and the conflicts we will face in our lifetime. But we first begin with God. Think of life without God. If you take the first two verses out of this chapter, you have no God. Mankind is left to himself. And in my class in seminary, people are here and people form groups and groups form traditions. And you have that throughout the entire world. In every part of the world, you have people and foreign groups and traditions, and then they form their own governments and their own laws and their own regulations. And even in the midst of all that, each of them have their own conflicts they go through in the existence of their nation. But God is above all this. He is beyond all this. And in one sense, he is separate from this. And untouched by this. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is immutable. He will not change. He is the same. And in his character, when we read his word, he loves us and he cares for us ever since he created us. Being descendants of Adam and Eve, death has come upon us. And up to this point of revelation, we realize since Genesis 3, chapter 19, is where we read that about being dust. And God says to Adam and Eve, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat that food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. 
but we realize God did not create us just with a body. This is all there is, all you're going to see. He created us spirit, soul, and body. We are more than just a physical body. Our body gives us a consciousness of everything around us, but our soul in, is conscious of other people and realities. We're conscious of ourselves and a soul consciousness of other people. And we have a spirit. We're conscious of God. But we realize the scriptures teach that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We may need to be made alive in Jesus Christ. He's the only one can make us alive unto God. And anyone doing any research, sociological, cultural research, will realize as mankind has been created, they worship something. They worship the moon. They worship the stars. They bow down. They create things to worship because we're made to worship God. And without God, we worship something. And that's seen throughout different uh, ethnic groups and, and lifestyles throughout history. It's just reality. When we read the word, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That is the mainstream thinking. There are gods. But we realize there is one God who has revealed himself through prophets and, and finally in the person of Jesus Christ. The God who loves us, who created us. Yet, sometimes people think they can live without God. And they really do. That philosophy of life, well, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I'll die. As if they have to think, this is it, this is all there is. There is no eternity. But God doesn't reveal that in his word. He created this spirit, soul, and body. We're going to live on when this body ceases to function. We're going to live on. One day this body will turn to dust. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just as a reflection of a prayer of the Apostle Paul uh, and others who prayed uh, for us, we pray for one another. The word says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Throughout the word we realize we are more than just a body. Spirit, soul, and body. God's from eternity. And he's different from us. Though we rebelled against him, he still loves us and cares for us. That text in verse 13, relent, O Lord. It, it's a cry to return to show favor. Return to show favor. The reality is God and who he is Though we're ever, forever beginning to learn about him through his word, is a God of love and his character and compassion and tender mercies, and he wants to redeem us. That's why even though Adam and Eve fell and disobeyed God, God would promise a future redeemer. He would bless. And that word relent, that word relent is also revealed in Genesis 18.10. In Genesis 18.10, it's used in reference to Abraham and Sarah, and specifically God's promise to Sarah in Genesis 18.10. Then the Lord said, I will surely return. That is the same word in, in Psalm 90. Relent, return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Of course, Sarah laughed and so on. The reality that God would continue 
to fulfill his word out of his own character before the foundation of the world, his character would send a redeemer. The redeemer would be coming. God would continue that on. Even through David, he would continue to fulfill his promise. Even though sometimes the line got very thin, God fulfilled his word and Jesus came into the world, born of the Virgin Mary. God was doing something about this reality of our death and the reality of our sin. But when we look at bookends of this picture, the bookends of God's existence before the creation of the world, everlasting God, and then his work due to our own sin and rebellion, he continues to work in his character and his person to redeem us and sends Jesus to die on the cross just as we have sung. And the reality of the book of Ephesians reveals it. That though we're dead in trespasses and sins, Jesus himself comes to redeem us. We've read in Ephesians 2, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Not only would we die physically one day, we only have a certain number of days here. None of us knows how many days those, those will be. Some are short, some are long. That's a mystery. But the reality is, we're all here only so many days. And no more will be added unless you're Hezekiah and you wondered if he should have even asked. You were dead. Not only are we, our bodies going to die, but our soul dies and our spirit dies in relationship to God. God is the one who has to make us alive again by his spirit. And as far as the spirit and soul, the real us is concerned, we're dead in our sins. We'll give an account before God. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We all follow someone. We all are being led and counseled by other people throughout our lifetime. Will it be God? Or will it be everybody else? All of us who used to live at that one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful natures, following these desires and thoughts like the rest, we were nature by nature objects of wrath, just as it would say in Psalm 90, objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression transgressions it is by grace you have been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus for it is by grace you have been saved through faith this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God not of works, so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we're here for a limited amount of time, and God works by His Spirit. We can see in this text, before God's character of work, before creation, the character of a heart that remains the same, even though we rebel against him, even though we're going to all return to dust, he wants to redeem us, spirit, soul, and body. And the reality is that we will receive a new body one day. A new body. And the word of God reveals that reality. Let me take a moment to find it. Philippians chapter 3, 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. 
So the power of the love of God in Jesus Christ, who came to die on the cross, has the power to forgive us our sins and will transform our lowly body one day to be like his glorious body. And in our character development, in who we are as people in Romans chapter 8, that the word of God reads, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, to become like Jesus. When we see him, he will work by his spirit for us to become like him. It's an ongoing work of his spirit in our lives. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 7 also reveals the same word return, return to me. God's heart is revealed in Malachi 3 7. The word, same word relent meaning return to me. The word of God reads in Malachi 3 verse 7. Ever since the time you, you ever since the time your forefathers have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Return to me, and I will return to you. And it's also interesting in Jonah. Remember Jonah, the reluctant prophet to to go to a city to, call, to tell them to repent. Finally, he goes to tell them to repent. And we'll, we'll fish to find Jonah here. That was a bad joke. Uh, Rome, jo Jonah 3.9. This is the king that responds. When he hears their message to repent or God's judgment is coming. This is what he says. That by decree of the king. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent. And with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Interesting text. And it would be good of us to follow this text in the sense in our day. That if God wants us and wants us to fast and pray and fast and miss, miss a meal or two, and fast and pray and seek him for our nation, our world, this would be a good time to do it. That's part of the returning. That's part of our relenting, crying out to God for grace and mercy and compassion. Though we deserve his judgment, we're asking for grace and mercy. Just like we deserve judgment, and all men will be judged, appointed unto men once to die, and after that to judgment, that we cry out to God and receive Jesus' son who took the wrath of God upon himself in our place. That now when we stand before God, we receive Jesus. We do not receive condemnation in any way for those who receive Christ. We've received Christ. We have been freed from any condemnation. Though we face the judgment seat of Jesus, what have we done with Jesus since we received him? called the Bema Seed of Christ, we are saved by the blood of Christ. We belong to him. So God is taking care of this issue in, of sin in, in the lives of people in the world through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is interesting also is to see the response of this person who's come into this reality of a consciousness of a fear of God, knowing that we will give an account before God of our lives. 
And we realize we're here only for so many days. And we used up some days this week, didn't we? And some of us are beyond the 70 years, aren't we? Then we're look at, looking at testimonies of grace. Testimonies of grace and mercy for people to continue on beyond those normal days that God has set. And we see some in mystery, mystery of Tom and uh, Henretti's grandson of Ford, a muscular atrophy and terrible to live that way. But God, that, that's something I leave with God. I don't understand. But pray his parents and the family through this. Or why some die early, some die young. All those same questions. But this person is crying out. And what do we cry out? Interesting, when you come to realize you only have so many days, it happens to be that we cry out for wisdom. We only have so many days left. Does wisdom... Is wisdom handed down from generation to generation? In one sense it is, and in another sense it's not. It's not something you receive under a tree at Christmas time. You don't receive a box of wisdom and a birthday card, right? Don't receive it that way. The fear of God, the word says in Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Become conscious that God has created me. I'm going to stand before him to give an account of my life. So therefore, how am I going to live? Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, return, O Lord, return, show your favor. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. They're, they're crying out in prayer to God, crying, crying out to him for compassion. We don't know how long it will be, how long we will be here. Have compassion on us, Lord. And then the text of the experience of life, but in relationship to God. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. We read other scriptures. His, his tender mercies are new every morning. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. The combination of gladness and joy and then make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us. For as many years as we have seen trouble, all of us will experience difficulty, heartache, discouragement, some even in despair throughout life. That's a given. But that's not where it ends. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. Our children are drawn into this relationship we have with God. And they see the relationship we have with God. They see how we're responding to the afflictions and the sadness. I had dear, one dear professor. He said, this, this is what sometimes we pray. Lord, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's kind of how we put it sometimes. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is where the difficult part of the message lies. Because God can work by his spirit in our lives within the framework of the number of days we have and none of us knows how many days there will be. But he who has endless days created us. We have a certain number of days. And then we're here in this world no more. But see, because of God's great love and mercy, he 
can cause us to move on from this body to dwell in his presence. Because the first verse, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. You are our dwelling place. And sooner or later, and I hope sooner we learn by God in his heart, in his grace, his heart toward us, that God dwells here outside of time. We're in time. He's infinite. We're finite. He's eternal. We're only here so long. He dwells in a place of righteousness and holiness and justice. And he created us. Yet we're descendants of Adam and Eve. He wants us to be with him. And Jesus came and died for us on the cross. And Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to be where I am. I'm going to be. I want to come back and take you to be with me. Out of time into eternity to be with him. Forever. Righteousness, holiness, unfailing love. A new body. A new place. Place of righteousness and peace. Far greater than we we'll have ever seen in this world. And this is a wonderful place to live. And I've enjoyed my life. I've had afflictions. I've had heartaches, discouragements. So have you. But Jesus wants us to be with him. In the meantime, what happens while we go through the afflictions and heartaches here? Well, inside of those bookends of God's grace and mystery of, the, of his person he works in second corinthians chapter 8 verse 2 he worked in this congregation a very interesting work and i'll read it for you second corinthians 8 verse 1 and 2 and now brothers we want you to know about the grace that god has given the macedonian churches out of the most severe trial their overflowing joy their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. In other words, just don't go together, humanly speaking. How can you have joy in the midst of some severe trial without God? Most people in severe trial want others to experience the same suffering they do. They want people to hurt like they do. And being in extreme poverty, having rich generosity, those two things don't go together either. But because of relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the work of his spirit, in the midst of severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. They wanted to give to help other poor believers, though they were in extreme poverty themselves. And they did not do as we expected but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. They gave themselves to the Lord. And in 1 Thessalonians, another example of a church of living this way. In 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 6. It reads... You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And some uh, versions read, long suffering with joyfulness. What occurs? How does this work out? Everlasting God. Everlasting God. Everlasting Father. Establish the work of your favor upon our lives. 
that our children will see and follow you. How does that take place? Everlasting God, establish the work of your favor upon our lives that our children will see and follow you. You know, that doesn't happen where every day is happy. Every day is without trouble. Every day is without affliction. Every day is without a challenge. You know how that happens? Is children see their parents on their faces and on their knees before God in their affliction, in their heartaches, in their sorrow. And they see them cast their cares upon the Lord for the Lord cares for them. And God takes that burden with them and only helps them to carry as much as he wants them to carry by his grace. And the children see mom and dad, the favor of God, the favor of God upon mom and dad and their relationship with him, that he sees them through the affliction and the conflict. Not avoiding it. They see him draw them closer together in the conflict as husband and wife, not farther apart. They see them love their children even more than they did in the affliction, not farther apart. They see the care and the love of God for, for the, of the parents toward God more in the affliction than they ever did before. Are they seeing that now in COVID-19? Are, are they seeing the dedication of moms and dads and their love for Jesus in the midst of this pandemic and everything else that goes with it? Or are they seeing them draw farther away from God and other people? What are they seeing? That's when they see the reality of of someone dwelling in the presence of Jesus. They see someone who is strengthened in the midst of the affliction. The affirmation of God's favor is upon their lives in the midst of the affliction. And instead of falling down and caving into trouble, they triumph in Jesus in the midst of the affliction. That's when you see someone dwelling in the presence of the living God. They love Jesus even more because they see beyond the conflict. They see beyond the suffering, just as Jesus did. As he completely revealed to me one of the greatest heartaches I had in ministry. And I sat at my desk and as a pastor, I'm going to give the truths. No, I'm not to just give the truths of the Bible. I'm to live the truths of the Bible to our children and those around me. And when I sat down at my desk and I read this verse, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning at shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And after I read that, who's, who for the joy set before him endured the cross? I said, you got to be kidding me. But God wasn't kidding. God wasn't kidding. And what he does in the affliction and the heartache, just like people normally Hopefully many normally see when they realize they're given this sentence of cancer and leukemia and other things in their lives. They know their days are numbered and their days are few. Their priorities become more important. What's more valuable in life now? What's more valuable? What's going to last? What's going to endure in life? What's more important in life? That's what affliction does. If we allow God by his spirit to work in us, it establishes priorities. What's more important? And it's not by following, it's not becoming a legalist and uh, become just in, in, in enforcing of do's and don'ts. 
It's coming into the dwelling presence of a loving God who loves us and cares for us, who is very loving and patient and kind and works with us and, and puts up with us. And that's what we do with our children. And not of all our children listen to the Lord. Sometimes we're in a difficult marriage relationship but we don't need to fall out of relationship with God. We need to fall into a relationship with God because he's faithful and loving and kind. No one will love us more than Jesus loves us. I love my wife, but Jesus loves Becky more than I do. And I'm learning to love her like Jesus loved me. That's the way it is. We love him because he first loved us, loved us. Entering into that love relationship and we're trusting God by his spirit to work in the lives of our children because the reality is we realize we don't make their decisions for them. I would have loved to make decisions for David and Alicia a few times in their lives. More than one time. But I can't. But I'm to, I am to love them and care for them. Keep the doors of relationship open uh, with them. May the favor of our Lord, our God, rest upon us. His favor rest upon us. That's what children should see. No one likes conflict and affliction. No one likes heartache. But how do we go through it? How do we go through it? Just on our own? My prayer is that we, I, my, this is my prayer, everlasting God, Father, establish the work of your favor upon my life that my children will see and follow you. I don't want my children to follow me. I want my children to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Follow him. And it's not the Christian Missionary Alliance right now. I might get in trouble for saying this. I'm recorded now, every word. But I want my children to follow Jesus. And to read his word and allow God by his spirit to help them develop their lives and relationship to him. I love the Christian Missionary Alliance. That's where I'm, I'm serving. And my children are always there. But my children saw the conflicts they, you know what they saw? They saw us fight. <laughs> I'm not a perfect pastor. They saw us reconcile. They saw us say, forgive me. They saw us work things out. That's how it happens. Because guess what they're doing? You know, there's some glorious marriage fights that our children had that I've never heard. Maybe one day. I don't know. I don't think so. But I know their reality it's just part of life because all of us want to be loved. That's the deep thing. As one professor said, we hunger for love more than we hunger for food. And that's true. That's true. We want love, be loved and cared for. And no wonder there are books written that of, of men and women who go to Jesus if their spouses are unfaithful, they cry out to God for grace and mercy. And he gives them grace and mercy to go on. I have seen some men and women love the Lord whose spouse has been un unfaithful. I have seen men and women who have been encouraged and examples to follow who love Jesus. And it's a great encouragement to me. And the reality is God loves you just as much as he loves me. And I say this to my immediate family who may listen to this one day. He loves you just as much as you love me as the oldest son in our family. He loves you, my brother and sisters, and my family as much as he loves me. He wants us, he wants you and I to know him as we are known, already known fully. We are beginning to know him when we read his word and pray and seek him. Yes, we're going to die, and there's nothing you can do about it except embrace the one who died for you so you can live forever, and his name is Jesus. 
He's the only one that can redeem you from your sin and the consequences of all of our sin. And he's the one and only one who becomes our wisdom in First uh, First Corinthians one. Uh, I believe it's the early part. Of the, Christ becomes our wisdom and our righteousness and our holiness. He's the one who gives us wisdom by his spirit to live. Lord, help me. Help me be the person you want me to be. Everlasting Father, can you pray with me? And bow your heads and pray with me if you want to. Everlasting Father, establish the work of your favor upon my life that our children will see and follow you. I pray in Jesus' name. Jesus' invitation stands. He wants you to know him. He already paid for the uh, way. We're watching a little video. I'll pick on Matt Chandler. We're watching a video where he's teaching on Philippians. He's in a high-rise apartment in Dallas overlooking all the cities. And I'm kidding our class. I wonder how many of us could afford that apartment overlooking Dallas. But you know, there's a greater place to be, greater dwelling to be one day. Will you be there? The invitation is already given. The way's already been paid. It's through Jesus. To receive him, he paid it all. To receive him as your Lord and Savior and be part of his family. His invitation always stands. He's dwelling there waiting for us to be with him. Shall we sing How Great Thou Art Together? Number 33, shall we sing together?